it for everybody. Okay, yeah, now we're recording. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Holly, for being here. It's a, it's an honor to have you here talking to us about studying music in the in the US, applying to music school in the US and to, to learn about your, uh, your experience there. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. You know, we have Holly Nelson. She is a, a Fulbright scholar who's uh, right now in our country. Uh, and uh, well, thank you, Holly, uh, for being here. The floor is all yours. I don't want to take time <laughs> of your presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's my honor to be here. I'm very happy to talk to all of you. Um, I was going to play a bit on my violin, but I've been kind of sick the last few days and I my ear is totally stuffed up right now. So <laughs> instead of performing, I actually thought it would maybe in some ways be more helpful for all of you if I play some of the videos that I actually used as my audition videos for music schools in the US. So these were my real music audition videos that I used to fulfill the pre-screening requirements for the conservatories that I applied to for um, my recent, my more recent programs. I don't have the, the videos I used for my undergraduate pre-screens because they, some of them unfortunately got lost when my old laptop died a couple years ago, <laughs> which is too bad. But these are the ones that I used for my master's degree application and my doctorate application. Uh, so I'm currently pursuing my doctorate uh, in music performance at the Peabody Institute, which is part of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and before that, I did my master's degree. Uh, well, Peabody is in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, if that's on the, the northeast uh, coast of the United States, uh, sort of the mid-Atlantic, we call it. And before that, I was doing my master's degree in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is in the center of the United States at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, which it has a ridiculously long name, so we just call it CCM. <laughs> but I'll, I'll talk more about all of the schools that I attended uh, later on in the video because I, I enjoyed my time at all of them. I did my undergrad at Manus College of Music, which is in New York City. I can talk a bit about my experience at those schools. There were other schools that I also attended that I can talk about for short degree programs. I can talk about why I chose to do that, uh, the pros and cons. But without further ado, I'm gonna play a few of the actual um, pre-screen videos I used. So let me get this started up. Hopefully I can share the video correctly. Okay, so this first video I'm going to share is my concerto video that I used for my doctoral application. So the video shows me performing the first movement of the Prokofiev Violin Concerto Number no. 2. I recorded this in a church in Cincinnati, so I had to make all of my prescreening videos while I was pursuing my master's degree. Um, so keep that in mind when you're applying to programs. You'll have to figure out a way to schedule your repertoire and make time to record on top of all of your coursework. Well, if, if you plan to apply for a program consecutively right after you finish the, the one you're in currently. Anyway, so this is me performing the first movement of the Prokofiev Island Concerto. It's very long, so I'll just play a bit of it. Can everybody see the video okay? Yes. Thank you. 
so that's the first video. So I just wanted to comment a little bit about, was everyone able to hear it and see it okay? Good, great. Okay, so one thing I wanted to comment about is, obviously I'm in a church. The reason I chose to record it in a church is because it was free. <laughs> so um, obviously there's no reason to spend a ton of money making your college application videos if there's a way that you can find a good venue to record for free. Now I stress good because your application videos are possibly the most important part of your whole conservatory or music university application. Um, I would guess that that goes, the, the same could be said for any music program here in Argentina or anywhere else in the world. The most important part is your musical application portfolio. So if you have to choose between paying an hourly rate to record in a studio, versus recording at a church, but the church has lots of weird background noise, or it's on a busy street where there's going to be a lot of sounds from cars and sirens, or if you don't have access to good recording equipment of your own, then in that case, it makes more sense to pay a little and go to a, a studio. Whatever you're going to be able to do that yields the best sounding and looking result. I would say the way that the video looks, not quite as important. Um, for example, I recorded this video on my iPhone but I had professional quality microphones set up in the church. I'm very lucky that my husband is really good at doing on-site recording. He uh, used to work doing audio recording um, when we lived in New York City. And so he has a few very good microphones and the stands and everything necessary to set them up for recording. Um, so we brought the microphones that he owns. And then on top of that, I also borrowed some microphones from my university, from CCM. So often, if you ask around, your music conservatory that you're currently studying at may have equipment that you're able to rent out, or, or not even rent out, just borrow for free. I was able to borrow several microphones for free from my college, but I had to sign you know, a waiver promising that I wouldn't <laughs> damage them or that I'm going to return them when I'm done, obviously. But you know, look around. Sometimes libraries have music equipment that they can rent out or loan out. Sometimes your college will have that. Sometimes community centers in your area may have um, audio equipment. You never know. So it's worth doing a little research and asking around. Um, see if you have friends that have microphones you can borrow. But if you're going to borrow equipment, very important, make sure you test it out before your recording date. Because remember that when you go to the site, you have a limited amount of time to use it. Even if you're borrowing a church, uh, generally they will only allow you to use it um, like late in the evening, after hours, once the daily activities of the church or synagogue or mosque or whatever are done for the day. So you will only have so much time that you're able to use a, a public space like that, for example, until it gets too late and you're just exhausted. So you also don't want to be recording when you're, you know, it's midnight or 2 a.m. or something like that. Um, so keep all of those things in mind. But I was very fortunate that I found this beautiful church that had a really nice piano in it. Um, one thing that I did do is that I paid to have the piano tuned before my recording session. So I wanted to make sure that the piano would be in tune because nothing is worse than recording with an out of tune piano because even if you're in tune, it will make everything you play sound out of tune in comparison. So I paid about $100 to have the piano tuned before my session. So the piano got tuned the day before my session. And then I, I went in and I recorded on, I think it was like a Saturday uh, in the early evening. Um, so just some things to think about. So I'm going to share another one. Let's see. This is, um, I think I need to stop the share and then redo the share to share this other audio. So this video I actually recorded at a, the, the chapel of a senior center where I was living as an artist in residence. I will talk a little bit more about that later, but that is um, artist in residence uh, scholarships or opportunities are a really great type of program to investigate if you're interested in studying in the United States because it's a great way to build experience. And for me, I was able to get free housing through this artist in residence program where I actually was given a really great apartment in a senior living community. So it's like a kind of like a retirement uh, neighborhood is the best way I can describe it. It's like a whole suburb with little houses and it's all for retired elderly people. 
which I loved. But anyway, so this is my solo box. So solo box, at least for string players, is something that almost always is required as part of your recommendation. Um, pianists often have to play some sort of Bach. For classical guitarists, I know that um, some type of transcribed Bach is often also required. So most instruments have to play some kind of Bach. Uh, so here is my Bach. So that's just an example of my solo Bach and I can tell you that when I recorded this, I, this was one of the last takes that I took of the evening and I kept taking more and more takes because every time I would run through it, I would make a different memory slip in a different place and it was very frustrating. Um, usually for conservatory programs in the United States, they require that you play all of your videos from memory which I don't know about all of you, but I really struggle performing from memory under pressure when I know that it's like, you know, uh, really important and I like I have to nail it. It just creates so much stress and pressure for me that sometimes I feel like my memory just blanks, like something short circuits. So I remember being very frustrated by the time I was taking, I think this was my 13th or 14th take of this very short movement of Bach. And I, I mean, I could play all of it, but I just kept having random memory slips. So um, all of that to say that when you are planning to do your college uh, pre-screening tapes, make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to record many takes because even though the requirement is that your pre-screening videos are not edited, you can't, so you can't edit the video itself. You know, you can't splice the audio or, or do stuff like that. They wanna see how you actually play. That said, there's nothing preventing you from taking a bunch of takes. Definitely take a lot of takes. Don't just play it once and then go, yeah, good enough. <laughs> I would say that if you are, especially if you want scholarship, remember that the, the uh, you're basically entering a competition. It's like an international competition. You have to think of it that way. It's a competition for scholarship money. So you want to put your absolute best foot forward. So I would say give yourself as many options as you can. Um, when I was preparing my doctoral pre-screens, for example, I recorded over multiple days. So I did just this movement of Bach on one day. Well, I think I had a couple movements of Bach that I needed to record. I, I maybe had like three, I think they asked for three contrasting movements of Bach or something like that. So I did my Bach on one evening for like six hours. <laughs> And then I took another four or five hours to record my Prokofiev two movements. So I had the first movement of the concerto and the second movement. And so I was hiring my pianist for about two of those hours or two and a half hours or something. So one hour or one and a half hours to set up all the equipment, test the lighting, test the sound with my husband helping me out. Um, two hours, or I forget if it was two or two and a half hours recording with my pianist, who was wonderful, Diana Chubak. Shout out to my amazing pianist, who I, I adore. She's a great pianist. Um, and then another hour and a half, two hours to break everything down and pack up all the audio equipment, uh, move the piano back to where it had been in the church, and put everything back exactly as it had been, which is one of the stipulations of being allowed to borrow the church. So make sure you give yourself plenty of time, basically, is what I'm saying. Don't expect to record all of your pre-screen videos in, like, two hours. 
that's way too much stress uh, and that's just an unrealistic timeline. I would say, for me anyway, that would be an unrealistic timeline. Um, of course, if you're performing all of your repertoire for your auditions in a live concert, definitely record the concert and you may get some Can everyone hear me? Uh, I think I lost everyone for a moment there. I'm not sure what happened. I think it I was think me. Um, you know what? I'm going to make you host just to make sure that this doesn't happen again because the connection apparently is not working as well uh, oh, okay. as usual because we generally don't have any issues. But today, <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll make you a host, okay? So that sure. that doesn't happen again. Okay, no worries. There. Okay, cool. So I'm going to just share one or two other videos and then I will get into the main um, presentation. So here's another that I used. So when you're applying for graduate programs, they will often want to see that you are, um, well here I will, I'll get the video. Um, when you're applying for graduate programs like a master's or doctorate program, the, the more advanced the degree that you're applying for, the more requirements they will have for pre-screens. So usually for an undergraduate program, and I'm, I'm speaking from my experience in classical music, I don't know that much about um, what the requirements are for jazz or pop studies, for example. But for classical music anyway, um, for undergrad, usually you need to play two contrasting movements of a concerto, um, one or two Paganini caprices, two contrasting movements of a Bach solo sonata or partita usually, and then maybe one showpiece. That's a very typical undergraduate requirement for violin majors. For example, for masters, um, they have more requirements. Usually you need to play a complete sonata or partita by Bach. You need to play a complete concerto, two Paganini caprices, perhaps a showpiece, and then sometimes they might ask for a sonata, but not, not always. And then as you get to applying for a doctoral program, the requirements are really massive. It usually requires more than an hour and a half of music total. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot of repertoire to juggle. So for my doctoral programs, I needed to play one complete romantic or contemporary concerto. And remember, this is all from memory, pretty much. Uh, so a complete romantic or contemporary concerto, a complete Mozart violin concerto with cadenza, a complete Bach partita or sonata, so that's about four to six movements, depending on how many uh, movements are in the particular one you choose, two Paganini caprices, a complete romantic sonata, and also a complete contemporary work. It's a lot of repertoire. <laughs> To, to manage. So I'll talk a bit later about managing repertoire and how to juggle repertoire well and make sure that everything is prepared in time for the, the audition. But this is the sonata that I selected for my doctoral auditions. I love Brahms. Um, so I'm just going to play a little bit of this. And this I recorded um, in one of the small halls at my master's degree program. <laughs> Thank you. 
there so that we don't go too long. But um, another thing that I'll bring up, you see that I'm wearing these kind of fancy type of recital dresses in all these videos. I will say that while the sound quality of your video is the most important part, it doesn't hurt to dress up. I would say treat the audition videos like a real life audition or like a, a concert. So wear whatever your nicest outfit is that you, you would typically wear for a concert, but do make sure that it's really comfortable. The last thing you want is a, I don't know, a shirt with like a really tight collar that itches you or pinches your neck or a dress with you know um, sleeves that are too tight and don't allow you a full range of motion for your instrument like violin or piano or guitar. Um, or if you're a singer wearing something that is really tight around your stomach and doesn't allow you to fill your diaphragm fully, for example, for, for really great breathing. So just think about all of those things. I would recommend even trying out the outfit that you're planning to wear for your audition videos or even your live auditions before you record or before you go to your live auditions, just to make sure that there's nothing weird in your outfit that is going to distract you. For example, kind of a funny story. I had a violinist friend who texted me freaking out when she got to her live auditions in the US. So this doesn't just apply to the US, this could be anywhere, but it's a good, good advice. So she texts me freaking out and she goes, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I've got this halter top dress that I'm wearing for my auditions and the top keeps coming like untied while I'm playing and I don't know what to do. And I keep tying it and it keeps like feeling like it's gonna fall down while I'm playing and I'm so freaked out and I don't know what to do and I'm so embarrassed. And it was like a disaster because she's a great violinist, but I think that the fact that her dress was not cooperating and she was just distracted and freaked out by the fact that it felt like it was getting loose and it could fall at any moment, completely distracted her and she did not play very well in her auditions and she was really upset afterwards. Um, so this is a good illustration of why you have to test out your outfit. Or another person that I know, a guy, um, this saxophonist that I know, he had bought these brand new dress shoes that he was very proud of, that he was gonna wear for his live auditions. Like they're these really shiny, you know, nice dress shoes. And he had never worn them before until the day of his live audition. So he, he got to the school that I was attending for my master's degree. And he walks out on stage and his shoes go <laughs> like as he's walking out and they just continue squeaking and making all this noise the whole time he was playing his audition. And he said it was incredibly distracting. And some of the judges were even chuckling during his audition because every time he turned or, or changed his weight, the, the shoes would go <laughs> <laughs> it was just kind of ridiculous. He still got in. He still, you know, managed to play well, but it was definitely distracting. And would he have played even better and gotten even more scholarship if he hadn't had these ridiculous squeaky shoes? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But just make your life easier and check out your wardrobe before the big day, right? Before the Im important day. So, um, Anyway, enough of that. I am going to start my slideshow. Now that you've gotten to see a couple of my videos, you have a better idea maybe of how they should look, how they should sound. Um, the sound quality is the most important thing. It's got to be really clear, really crisp. Obviously, you want the video to look nice as well. You don't... Um, uh, you don't want the video to be too close to you. Like this would be way too close. Many times the audition video requirements will say that they need to be able to see your whole torso. For example, they need to be able to see both of your arms completely to make sure that you're not faking anything that, you know, somebody else isn't playing the piano for you or, or whatever, or that you don't have a music stand hidden off screen uh, because, you know, they're requiring that you play everything from memory and they really want you, they want to see that you're actually playing from memory. So uh, look at all the requirements for the videos carefully, get the best microphones you can possibly get. I think the video quality is not quite as important. Obviously you don't want it to be grainy and have, um, you know, to be jerky or, or not smooth, but the video quality is not quite as important as the audio. The audio needs to be really pristine. And while they say that you can't edit the audio at all, I would say that, um, you should use EQ. You should do EQ, meaning adjusting the bass, treble balance, um, perhaps adding a bit of reverb if the space that you record in is really, really dry. 
Um, technically, that's editing, but I would strongly recommend that you do adjust the EQ and uh, just make sure that the, the sound overall of the video really is the most flattering and the best sound you can possibly get. It makes a big difference. Um, and it's your, your first hurdle that you have to get over when you're applying to music schools. So you want to make sure that your first impression with these pre-screen videos is the absolute best impression you can get. All right, I'm going to start my slideshow presentation. So um, this is one of my favorite halls. This is Carnegie Hall, um, which has an amazing acoustic. I've been lucky to get to play there many times as part of orchestras. Uh, this is the big um, Stern Auditorium. It's, it's beautiful. So, let's see. So, I selected this video, uh, this image of Indiana University to start with because this gives you a good idea of the size of some universities in the United States. And I also wanted to start with this because it's a good example of a a large state university with a really excellent conservatory um, within it. So there are many different types of music schools in the United States. Some are conservatories, which are specifically just music programs. So they're, um, they're not going to have a lot of big academic programs and other subjects. Everything is just focused on music. Uh, whereas a school like Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana is a huge university that has really strong programs in all kinds of um, fields like science, math, linguistics, history, etc. But it also happens to have a really excellent music school, the Jacobs School of Music, within the university. Um, one of the pluses of going to a large school like this is that they often have more scholarship money so more scholarship opportunities. They have amazing facilities. So you can see that they have these um, two really beautiful large concert halls. And then I think they also have some smaller recital halls as well. Um, and it's got a gorgeous large campus. Another plus is that if you're not quite sure yet if you want to study just music, or if you're considering possibly um, having another major, let's say in science or in writing, and you are thinking about doing a double major or having a minor in music, this would be a really great situation, a school like this that has a strong um, university with many general education kinds of courses, but then also has a great music school within it. And I can keep this sidebar open if anybody has a question and wants to stop me. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. All right. So next we have, um, this is the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, CCM, which is the school that I attended uh, for my master's degree. So as you can see, it has a massive campus. If you look at the back of the photo, the background of the photo, the campus extends basically as far as the eye can see. So it's a huge, huge campus. Um, I bring this up because another thing to note is that when you're visiting campuses for your live auditions in the US, make sure you study the campus map ahead of time because the walking distances can actually be really long, up to like 30 minutes plus. Um, for example, if you go visit CCM to audition, uh, you might want to visit like the student union or go see the student dorms, but those are about, I believe, a 30 minute walk away from the music school. So it can be quite far. So just make sure that you get a map and familiarize yourself with the layout. Uh, find out if you are going to need to call a cab to get from one point to another because sometimes the walking distance can be um, quite far. Another thing I wanted to mention about the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music is that like Indiana University, it is a large general university. So they have an excellent medical program. They have an excellent science department. Um, you can study pretty much any subject at the University of Cincinnati, but they also have an excellent music conservatory that's part of the school. Um, this is one to remember because they also give a lot of scholarship. There are a lot of opportunities for international students. This is the school that uh, I did the um, artisan residence at the senior center through. 
So that's definitely a school to consider. They have very generous scholarships. This is the school that I did my undergraduate studies at, the New School University, Manus College of Music in New York City. Um, uh, <clears throat> so actually, the hall that's down at the bottom is not a hall that is owned by Manus. That is Alice Tully Hall in New York City, I believe. But I was lucky to be able to perform in Alice Tully many times while I was a student at Manus because um, it's located in New York City and the school, I believe, rented out the hall. So something to consider when you're looking at your school is not just the facilities within the school itself, but the facilities in the surrounding area. If you are going to a school in a city like New York City, for example, there are all these incredible halls and all these incredible arts organizations around you that can really enhance your experience in the school. So it's something to consider. Obviously, there's a higher cost of living in New York City. Um, that has to factor into your decision. But obviously, going to school in New York City, which is pretty much the epicenter of the arts and music scene in the United States, is very different from studying at a place like the Univers uh, University of Indiana, Bloomington. Um, both are wonderful and both have their, their pros and cons. Um, in New York City, you will have an endless array of concerts and opportunities and um, possibilities for networking and making professional connections. Whereas uh, in Indiana, in a, in a school like Indiana Jacobs School of Music, most of the opportunities are going to be coming from within the school. That said, it's a huge school and they have tons of opportunities within the school. You'll also be paying way less in rent in a place like Blooming is in Indiana versus New York City. No comparison. For example, I believe you could rent a room in Bloomington, Indiana for around $200 a month if you're willing to share with roommates. Whereas in New York City, even with roommates, and this is 10 years ago, I was still paying close to $700 per month for a room in a shared apartment uh, in not such a great area of New York City. So that just gives you an idea of the contrast in price in these two locations. Um, here we've got the Cleveland Institute of Music. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, an excellent uh, music school, very prestigious. They have this beautiful concert hall, which I love. Um, uh, this is a good example of a conservatory. So uh, they don't really offer a lot of other academic subjects or courses. Everything is going to be surrounded around music, so uh, or centered on music, music theory, music history, ear training, solfege, dictation, secondary piano lessons for non-piano majors, uh, perhaps singing in choir, but everything is related to music. And then of course you have your, your private instrumental lessons and chamber music, orchestra, things like that. But you would not be able to pursue a degree in let's say math or linguistics at the Cleveland Institute of Music. It's only music majors. There are other universities nearby in Cleveland, for example, where you could potentially uh, pursue a dual major. I think that they have a relationship with Case Western Reserve University, which is nearby in Cleveland. But then you would be um, you would be working with two different institutions that have a partnership, so it wouldn't be within the same school. Here we've got uh, New York City. Everybody still able to hear me okay? Good, okay, great. Um, so this is New York City, uh, my favorite city. Well, I have a love-hate relationship with New York City. <laughs> I lived there for 12 years. I know it very well. I love New York City. It is a very expensive place to live. Um, and looking back on my time studying in New York City as a very young person, uh, I moved there when I was, I think I moved there when I was maybe 17, right before I turned 18. I think I turned 18 a few days after I moved to New York City. So I was very young. I think it was about almost 18. And I lived there until I was, I think, 26 or so. Um, and I love it. It's an amazing city. There's so much to do. This photo is showing Lincoln Center, 
which is possibly one of the most famous parts of the city arts-wise. You've got the Metropolitan Opera, the American Ballet Theater, the New York Philharmonic right there. And then in the background, in that sort of uh, gray, triangular-shaped building that's slightly hidden, that's the Juilliard School. Excuse me. So um, this, this area is kind of the epicenter of all the, the artistic life in New York City, or the, the institutional um, artistic life, I should say. Uh, Juilliard is one of the most famous music schools in the United States. It's very well known. It's an amazing school. Uh, I, I will say it is super selective and also not known for giving a ton of scholarship. So the reason that I include Juilliard is that keep in mind that a lot of schools like Juilliard, okay, Juilliard, um, Cincinnati uh, Institute of Music, I, I mean, sorry, Cleveland Institute of Music, um, Curtis, uh, schools like this are ultra competitive. There's nothing wrong with applying for them and trying, but I would say never only apply to schools like Juilliard, Curtis, Manus, um, because not only is it ultra competitive to get past the pre-screening and get accepted, but the chances of getting a full scholarship are very, very slim. Even for the best students, the most qualified students, because they're in large cities and the schools have to pay their rent, right? They have to pay the rent on these massive buildings that they, they occupy. They need to make a certain amount of revenue. That's just the reality that I've, I've realized over time. So they often don't have as much scholarship to, to throw around as schools in more rural locations or smaller cities, for example, like Indiana University or schools that are in even smaller cities like Savannah, Georgia or Columbus, South Carolina, things like that. So do shoot for the moon. You know, if your dream is to go to Juilliard or to go to Curtis or, or a school like that, do apply. But leave your options open. Make sure you apply to lots of smaller schools as well. Don't make your only application be to Juilliard or to Yale, um, something like that, one of these ultra competitive schools. And there are more reasons. It's not just because the chances of getting into a school like Juilliard or Yale or CIM are smaller, but also even if you did get into Juilliard, let's say you get into Juilliard, but you only get a tiny fraction of scholarship that doesn't even remotely cover the full tuition. But let's say you applied to a lesser known school, wherever, you know, a less famous music program, and they offer you a full scholarship because they're really excited about your playing. They really want you to attend their school. They feel that you would really enhance the program. Okay, so now you've got a full scholarship offer from this smaller, lesser known school, and you've got this really puny scholarship offer from uh, a heavy hitter like Juilliard. What you can do if you have this really great offer is that you can go to the scholarship office, the, the office of, of finance at the school at Juilliard and say, hey, I'm so glad that I was accepted here at Juilliard, but it would be really difficult for me to attend with only this small scholarship with just a 5,000 a year scholarship when the tuition costs over $35,000 a year. I have this full scholarship offer from this other smaller school, would you be able to match their offer or would you be able to give me a better offer of scholarship to, you know, sweeten the deal, essentially? You obviously you have to ask this in the most respectful, polite way possible, but it can be really helpful to have additional scholarship offers from other schools that you can leverage um, in order to get more scholarship at your dream school. Um, I've done this in the past. Um, I did this with my undergrad. I went to Manus for my undergrad where I did not have a full scholarship. I had a good scholarship, but I was able to negotiate a better scholarship by leveraging a full scholarship uh, offer that I got from Indiana University, uh, which is also a great school but I was really dead set on going to school in New York City. That was what I wanted to do. And so I, I contacted this scholarship office and I said, look, I got this full scholarship offer at IU. I really wanna to go to Manus, but it's gonna be very difficult for my family to afford paying X amount of money. Can you increase my scholarship? 
And it worked. I didn't think it would work, but it actually did. It, I, I had other good offers from several other undergraduate schools. Um, and by demonstrating that my family had legitimate financial need, plus showing that I had these other competing offers from other universities, I was able to get Manus to significantly increase the amount of scholarship that they were willing to offer me. So that is a good trick to have up your sleeve. And that's a really good argument in favor of applying to multiple schools. Even though it means, you know, you have to go through the extra headache of applying, doing more applications, paying more application fees, potentially juggling more repertoire because each school can have their own slightly different repertoire. They often overlap somewhat, but sometimes they'll have their own specific requirements. But within reason, I think it's a good idea to apply to multiple schools. Maybe you should aim for like five or six. I think that's about how many schools I applied to for my undergrad. I, I did about five or six applications and it's a good idea to also have a safety school. So a school that you know for sure you will get into. Maybe you already know the professor there. Maybe you already currently study with them. Maybe you've already been told essentially by faculty at the school that they like your playing and that yes, you would definitely be accepted to the school. Or you just know that your level of playing would, would be a shoe in You would be a sure bet to get into that school. So for me, I applied to a local university close to where I grew up for my undergrad. I didn't want to study there. It wasn't my dream. You know, I was kind of sick of my area and I wanted to, to move somewhere else and, and get experience living you know, out on my own, but I applied just as a backup, as a safety measure. And you know, I got a full scholarship offer from that school with a stipend and I was able to use that offer also as leverage to increase my other scholarship offers. So even though I didn't really want to attend that school, it wasn't, a, it wasn't even in my top three, let's say. I, I wasn't crazy about the idea of attending that school, but I'm glad that I applied because then I was able to take that really juicy offer and then leverage it to get more money at my top school, which was Manus. All right. So this is Peabody. This is where I currently go to school for my doctorate. I love Peabody. It's a great institution. Um, this is the beautiful uh, George Peabody Library that is attached to the school. I love it. It looks like it's something out of Hogwarts or something. It's, it's so beautiful. Um, I was lucky to get to play a concert in there once with a string quartet, which was really cool, really fun. Um, so Peabody is another, it, it's an example of a conservatory within a university. So it's part of Johns Hopkins University, which is a wonderful research university. Um, and then it has this great little music conservatory within the university. Uh, so if you, for example, are really interested in studying medicine or science or political science, Johns Hopkins has amazing programs in all of those areas, plus a really, really strong, um, you know, top music conservatory in the United States. Here's Curtis, um, which is an ultra prestigious conservatory in the United States. One thing that is good to note about Curtis is that they are completely tuition free. Everybody who gets accepted to Curtis automatically receives a full scholarship. So as you can imagine, this makes it extremely competitive. Um, but if you can get into Curtis, it's one of the best music schools in the world that you can study at. It's, it's a phenomenal opportunity. Okay. So now that I've shown you some tantalizing photos of like beautiful, uh, you know, U.S. music conservatory campuses, um, I want to just talk briefly about the pros and cons. I already talked about some of them. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a bit sick. Uh, <laughs> so obviously I'm biased, but I really do believe that U.S. music conservatories are some of the best and most competitive in the world. Um, you receive a world-class musical education there. They have modern facilities, lots of resources. Um, many of them are extremely well endowed. So they just open up all these resources for you. Um, if you're studying in the United States, you can also become fluent in English, which opens up a lot of teaching and performing opportunities around the world. Um, they have a lot of famous world-renowned professors teaching there. 
Um, also, if you play an orchestral instrument, I think it's good to note that U.S. orchestras are some of the highest paid in the world. So if you're able to get into a top-tier U.S. orchestra, the salary is, for, for top-tier orchestras, the salary is often around 100000 to 120000 but it can go up to 200000 plus if you get a principal chair in an orchestra, in a top-tier orchestra. Um, and even a lot of second-tier orchestras pay between sixty and $80,000 a year. So the salaries can be very, very good, very lucrative. Um, and if you're studying in the United States, it's a way to extend your time in the U.S. so that you have more time to potentially audition for orchestras like this, um, take lessons with concert masters to make connections, get to know these orchestras. So if you play an orchestral instrument and that's something that would interest you in the future, potentially playing professionally with a, an orchestra in the United States, studying in the U.S. can be a really great first step, especially if you're able to get into the studio of a, um, a musician who plays in one of the orchestras that you would like to play with. Often professors will ask their students to sub in the orchestra that they play with, if it, whether it's the concertmaster or the principal flute or the principal oboe, etc. They will often ask their best students to sub for them when they feel that they're ready. So that can be a really pivotal moment in your music career when you get asked to sub in your professor's orchestra. Um, it can be a great way to make your first impression on the ensemble. Um, I know many musicians who have eventually won positions in a professional orchestra and that was sort of how it all started when they got asked to sub by their professor. Cons. The most obvious con is the expense. U.S. music schools can be ridiculously expensive. Um, most U.S. students don't pay the full price. The good news is that most U.S. conservatories or universities offer a lot of scholarship. The difficulty is that if you're applying as an international student, often the resources are going to be limited to merit-based scholarship, meaning that basically they're going to be willing to offer you lots of scholarship if you are an excellent musician. So the better your audition is, the more money you're going to get offered. Financial or, or need-based or um, need-based scholarship is usually limited to U.S.-based students, unfortunately. Sometimes need can be factor, factored into it. For example, with the artist in residence program that I did in Cincinnati, several of the students were international students, and the um, the senior center took that into their consideration because they wanted to take on students who not only were the most promising who who played really well because part of the artisan residency was that we would give monthly solo recitals for the seniors that was our our job per se in exchange for the free housing um but they also prioritized students who were international students and who were needy um because the the senior center was also a uh, registered nonprofit charity so they were thinking like a charity, you know, they were trying to make their, their resources and their money help those who were most in need. So, um, for example, one of the other students in residence who's been in that program is from China and really needed support for housing, for example. Um, another student was from Mexico and really needed help covering the cost of housing. So... They were all really excellent musicians on top of that, but the fact that they had financial need actually worked in their favor um, for consideration for that, that artisan residency. Um, another con of US music schools is that they're often highly selective. Obviously, this is variable. It depends on which university or which conservatory you're applying to. Juilliard is ultra selective. So is Curtis, so is Manus, so are a lot of these music schools that I showed in my... Um, my images, those are some of the top music schools in the US. But not every music school is as selective. And I would strongly encourage you to look farther afield, right? Don't only apply to the most competitive music schools, especially if you are hoping to get a full scholarship or at least a, a close to full scholarship. I wanna tell a brief story about my husband. My husband plays the violin also. He's also a professional violinist. He was born in Cuba. So his family are first-generation immigrants to the United States. And when his family got to the U.S., they had no savings, basically. They were political refugees from Cuba. 
they moved first to Spain and they had a very difficult time in Spain. Um, it was really hard for uh, his parents to make money in Spain, partly because of prejudice against them because they were from Cuba, they weren't Spanish. And then they moved to the US eventually, um, partly because his parents wanted them to grow up in the US and to have opportunity, more opportunity in the US than what they were able to find in Spain. But it was, it was difficult, right? They didn't have a lot of money. And my husband knew that if he wanted to go to music school, he would need to get a full scholarship. It just would not be possible for his parents to take out a big loan. They hadn't been in the US long enough. They weren't yet citizens, so they couldn't, apply, they couldn't qualify for a lot of the federally funded student loans that US citizens are able to take out to pay for college. So with all of this in mind, you know, he applied to big schools like Juilliard and, and New England Conservatory, at schools in, in Boston and in other major cities. But he also ended up applying to a smaller school, the College of Charleston in um, South Carolina, which was not his first choice. It wasn't even his third or fourth choice necessarily. But somebody had told him about this school and said, hey, you should consider this college. You know, it's smaller. It's less competitive, but there's a really good violin teacher there who I think you could work really well with. And they are known for giving really good scholarships for, for talented musicians. So he applied to all the schools. He didn't get into some, he got into others, but he didn't get nearly enough scholarship at the really competitive schools to, to be anywhere close to what he could afford. Um, which is frustrating, but then he found out from the College of Charleston that he was offered a full scholarship there, which was like a miracle for him. You know, he had thought that he was going to have to reapply in another year and, or, or give up on this dream of going to music school. But he got into the College of Charleston and not only did they give him a full scholarship, but when he explained that he had, he still had unmet financial need, right? It's one thing to get into the school with a scholarship, but then you still have to figure out how you're gonna pay for housing. How are you gonna pay for food? Um, he explained all of this to the school. And because he had played a really good audition at the school and they really wanted him, which is important, right? The school has to want you. And if they really want you, they will be willing to bend some rules and, and really work hard to get you on board, right? So because they really liked him, they really liked his playing, they felt that he would be a strong asset to the school, they asked their donors, like the school's uh, philanthropist donors, if anybody had a spare room that he could stay in. And they actually ended up finding a philanthropist who had a spare room who agreed to let him stay at their house free of charge. So it was like an added scholarship on top of the other scholarships he already had. So he was able to live rent free in this house for the first year of his, his program. And eventually he was able to make connections. He was able to earn a little money, you know, within the, the legal hours that as a, an international student, he was allowed to, to earn because he still wasn't a US citizen at that point. Um, but he eventually was able to make it work, right? So that little bit of extra help from the university made it a reality for him. Um, so I just wanted to share that story because it can be difficult as an international student to study in the US. It's also difficult for US students to study as international students in other countries. I was interested in studying in um, England for my master's degree and I applied to the Royal Academy of Music and the Royal College of Music. And I got into both, but I didn't get in with a full scholarship. And when I started looking at all the extra fees for international students, all of the um, kind of hidden costs, plus the high cost of living in London, and the fact that as an international student, I was only gonna be allowed legally to work a very limited number of hours per week, it just didn't, uh, didn't make that much sense. So I would say that when you want to, when you're looking into studying as an international student, your first goal should be trying to get as close to a full scholarship as possible. Um, and then also trying to see if you can find a way to fund your housing, either through private scholarships or through additional stipends from the university or special artisan resi residence programs. Um, because just remember that as a non-citizen, you are likely going to have restrictions on how many hours a week you can legally work with just a student visa. So that's important to keep in mind. You can't assume that you're gonna be able to make all this money on a monthly basis once you're in another country. That's often not possible. It's not realistic. 
Um, also, uh, TOEFL requirements. So, um, well before you start trying to apply to music programs, I would say make sure that you are taking English classes or that you're testing your English level to make sure that you would be able to pass the TOEFL requirements. The TOEFL requirements are not extremely stringent. Um, they just want to make sure that you're going to be able to communicate at a, a conversational level. I think that the requirement is similar to B1 or B2 um, for TOEFL. So it's you don't have to be completely fluent, uh, but you do need to be able to hold a basic conversation. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, even if, if, if you weren't able to hold a basic conversation, would you want to study in another country, really? I mean, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to understand the coursework, right? And that you're going to get the most out of it. Otherwise, it's going to be a very uh, frustrating, overwhelming experience. I know that my my husband told me that when he first came to the U.S., he actually was very lucky to get a scholarship to a performing arts high school. So he had actually moved to the U.S. first to, to go to an arts high school in California, where he also was lucky to get a full scholarship. And when he first got to the high school, he barely spoke any English. And he said it was very frustrating. It was hard to communicate, hard to make friends. Um, so don't let that be you. <laughs> he said it was it was kind of isolating at first because it was just hard to communicate. Um, so he said that if he could go back and do it all over again, he would have made sure that he prepared a lot more with his English level before moving to the US and before starting a program. Okay, <laughs> I like this picture. So when I talk to Argentinians and ask them what their idea of studying at a US college or university is, they sometimes they tell me like this is their their image of studying in the United States. And while yes, that might be part of the experience at a large state school once in a blue moon, the reality is that as a music student, your reality is going to be more like this. <laughs> You're going to be spending a lot of time in a practice room. Um, it's not like, you know, on American Pie or <laughs> some of these movies that you might have seen. It's, it's not as glamorous. I mean, it's glamorous in some ways in that you get to work with these uh, like star studded faculty, amazing professors, um, that you get to have amazing facilities, beautiful concert halls, uh, access to really great recording studios, recording equipment, uh, really nice pianos, all of that. That's very glamorous and very nice. But the day-to-day -day reality is you're going to be spending a lot of time in a, a practice room like this. Um, which also, culturally, I think one of the big differences between studying in Argentina and studying in the U.S. is that at times I get the sense that music school in the U.S., could be a lot more cutthroat and a lot more demanding. Um, I, I Disclaimer, I haven't attended uh, music school here in Argentina, although I am uh, currently playing with tango orchestras here. Uh, I was playing with a tango orchestra at the Conservatorio de Manuel de Fascia, and now I'm playing with a tango orchestra at um, La Universidad Nacional de las Artes, UNA. So I do interact with uh, Argentinian conservatory students, so I get a bit of a sense of what the environment is like, the sort of the, the ambiance, the energy. And one of the things that I love coming from the US is that Argentinians are so chill and friendly and relaxed and um, very supportive and kind with one another. Unfortunately, I have to say that it's not always like that in the US. Um, at least in some of the top conservatories, in the most competitive conservatories, they often are quite a bit more cutthroat. Everybody treats every orchestra rehearsal uh, like a competition. There is a lot of um, ego. <laughs> there can be a lot of competition. People are not necessarily trying to be buddy-buddy with one another. People are in competition with one another, and everyone is trying to be the best. Everyone is trying to win that next orchestra audition or become the professor's teaching assistant next year because it looks good on your resume because it's the way to get a step up to your next uh, the next step in your in your career in your musical life so keep that in mind if you are somebody who doesn't have a thick skin and you don't take criticism well or you're not comfortable with a, a fast-paced competitive environment 
it might not be for you, or at least studying in one of these top conservatories in the US may not be for you. You may find that it feels kind of lonely and a little unfriendly at the top, to be completely honest. I don't think it's necessarily that way at less competitive schools, maybe smaller programs, programs in more rural areas or in smaller cities. Um, those may be more laid back, more chill, more welcoming. Um, but I will say from personal experience at music schools in large cities, like at Manus, like at Juilliard, like at um, New England Conservatory in Boston, et cetera, et cetera, or San Francisco Conservatory in, in San Francisco, um, USC in Los Angeles, at any of these top schools, it's gonna be a pretty competitive environment. That doesn't mean you won't make friends. You will, obviously you will make friends. There are gonna be nice, uh, you know, caring, laid back people in every environment that you can find. I have wonderful friends that I made at Manus and in New York City from the music scene. But in general, expect the, 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 the general attitude to be a bit more frosty than it is in Argentina. Not everybody is out to be your friend. Um, just, just keep that in mind. That said, I also think that it could be an opportunity for a lot of personal growth. Because if you're in an environment where everybody is chill, everybody's laid back, everybody is ultra understanding all the time, that may not push you to work your absolute hardest or try your absolute best. It's not gonna get you accustomed to the stress and the demand for performance that you may experience in a professional orchestra of a top tier quality. So it depends on what you want. If you want to be competitive, to enter into a really high paid orchestra in one of the top orchestras in the world, then this is probably the kind of experience that you need and that you need to kind of prepare yourself mentally for. <laughs> All right, deadlines. The most annoying part of the whole <laughs> application process. So the most important deadline to remember is December 1st. So every college application is gonna vary a little bit, but most of the time, all uh, music programs are gonna require that you submit your pre-screening videos. So like the videos that I showed at the beginning of the discussion, all of your videos, all of your audio and everything is gonna be need, is going to need to be ready to go by or slightly before December 1st. Um, and make sure just for your sanity that everything is recorded, double checked, triple checked, uh, well before that deadline. So um, in the United States, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving, which is a really important family holiday for us. It's, it's when we all tend to gather with our relatives from who are all living far up across the country from one another. We typically gather at somebody's house, usually like the grandma or grandpa or something like one of the older members of the family who has a big house. And then we have this massive feast. It's really nice. The reason I'm mentioning that is that it's right before this deadline. It's usually around November 26th, 25th, 24th. The date changes a little bit every year. But uh, I just remember that for so many years, I was always so stressed during Thanksgiving. And uh, there was even one year where I missed Thanksgiving because I didn't have all of my material ready together in time for my college applications. And I was just kicking myself because I remembered that I was uh, like, you know, locked in a room practicing, stressing out about having my applications ready on time, trying to re-record things and, and freaking out that my applications weren't going to be ready in time. And, uh, you know, I missed Thanksgiving and I felt very guilty. Uh, all of this to say, just don't be me. <laughs> don't do that. Um, make sure that you prepare everything way in advance. Uh, especially with the videos, because videos take a long time to process, right? When you have the raw video on your phone or whatever, you have to process it through onto your computer and then you have to upload it. And the upload often takes a really long time to upload onto these application websites. And glitches can happen. If you wait until the last minute, very likely everybody else is also trying to upload their videos around the same time. And so sometimes the servers crash which has happened to me in the past. So just make sure that you, you get all of your videos prepared well in advance so there's no last minute freaking out. Everything is ready and you can just, you know, 
be calm and know that everything's prepared and not have to worry about anything going wrong with your videos or not having all of the information. Um, early decision is an, an interesting thing to take note of. So if there's a school that you know that if you got in, you would for sure attend that school. It's like, let's say it's your dream school and you are really committed to attending that school. Some, some colleges offer something called early decision where you submit all of your materials a bit earlier. Usually it's around November 1st. So it's about a month earlier than the normal deadline. And, uh, what happens is that by signing up for early decision, you, your application is given more consideration or, or preferential consideration. So I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but I, I assume it means that they're putting the early decision applications kind of in one pile that they'll look at first and they give those priority because they know that you're committed to attending the school if, you're, if you get accepted. You have to remember that from the admissions point of view, they're just as nervous that they're going to offer students admission who are then going to turn it down, right? Because they have to make sure that they get a certain number of incoming students to be able to pay all of their bills. They need to get enough income. They have all these different things to balance and consider. They have to make sure they get a certain number of each instrument to have the orchestra be populated with the right number of instrumental players, right? They need to make sure that each faculty member is happy because they have a large enough studio. So they're getting enough hourly um, teachable hours in their salary, right? They have to make sure they have the right proportion of undergrads to graduate students. All of these considerations are going on in their mind. So they like to know ahead of time a certain number of students who are already committed. It gives them a little peace of mind. The thing to keep in mind with this early decision is that you have to sign a contract. It's a binding contract. And it essentially says that if you are accepted, you have to attend that school. You have to accept to go to that school. So it's a bit of a gamble. But if you know that for sure that's your top choice and that if you got into that school and you got a good enough scholarship, you would go, it's worth considering um, signing up for early decision. It can help like just push you past whatever extra hurdles and make sure that you get into that, that dream school. And last, most importantly, oops, I skipped. Last and most importantly, wait until you've heard back from all of your schools before you start booking your audition travel. <laughs> this is really important. So sometimes schools drag their feet and you can't really assign any importance to the time that you hear back from the school. Some schools will be really fast to let you know after they get your pre-screen and you'll hear like the week after you submit your pre-screen. Sometimes it will take a month and a half. This can be very frustrating because if you're waiting to hear back from the last school or two and you're you know dying to book your flights before they get more and more expensive, it can be tempting to just go ahead and book um, travel before you've heard back from all the schools, but don't do that because I will tell you a, a brief anecdote. A friend of mine who is a percussionist was applying to a bunch of doctoral programs and he had heard back from three of the five that he had applied to. And he, the two that he hadn't heard back from were the most competitive. They were his dream schools, but he assumed because he hadn't heard back from them yet that he didn't get in, right? So he had just kind of written them off. He said, well, whatever. I, I probably didn't get in, so forget it. I'm just gonna book my other flights because you know every week that I wait, the flights get more expensive. It's, and he was very stressed. So he, he just went ahead and booked uh, flights for the other auditions he'd already been invited to. Literally the day after he booked the flights, he found out from both of those schools that he um, was invited to come audition. <laughs> And so, because those were his two dream schools, obviously he wanted to audition, but now his, uh, his flights that he had scheduled were right in the middle of when he was supposed to be auditioning for the other, the two dream schools. <laughs> so he ended up having to move his flights. Luckily they were, they were changeable flights, but he had to pay the, the, the change fee, which was like $200 per flight, you know, almost as much as the flight itself. So don't do that. Don't do what my, my friend did. Just hold out as long as you can. Um, you can always write to the Office of Admissions and pro, you know, probe them a little, I mean, prod them a little. Like say, hey, I'm, uh, I say it in the nicest, most polite way possible, but say, hi, you know, I submitted my application before the deadline. I'm just wondering if you've received all of my materials and when decisions will be going out about the pre-screen. Um, 
Sometimes, this doesn't happen very often, but sometimes they lose track of applications. Some applications might fall through the crack. I know I asked, I, I, I sent sort of an update email like this to a school once. And I said, hi, I'm just checking in that everything's okay with my application. I haven't heard back yet. It's getting close to when I need to book my audition travel. Just wanted to know when they might make decisions. And then they wrote back, oh, we didn't see that you had applied. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> that's not good. I said, well, I mean, I have the receipt for my application fee. I, you know, I took a screenshot of it to make sure that I would have proof that I had paid it and that I had submitted my application before the deadline. So I sent them that. They kind of scrambled and looked through all of their things. And I said, oh, yeah, you did submit an application. We lost it, but we found it. And so <laughs> they let me know this. And they said, oh, yeah, you were, you were accepted. Your pre-screen was accepted. Sorry about that. Here's your audition date. Who knows what happened? I don't know, you know, why the delay or why it took me emailing them to, <laughs> to have them find my application. I mean, I paid my fee and I submitted everything on time. But you know, stuff happens. Sometimes you have to remind them and just, uh, if it's getting suspiciously late, just say, hey, just wanna make sure everything's okay. I wanna make sure you got my application. Is everything good, you know? Doesn't hurt to ask as long as you ask in a, a friendly and polite, respectful way. Okay. Um, Holly, just a, a sec, just a, a comment. We have 15 minutes left, including questions. Okay, sure. All right. Maybe we can ask questions now then, because I think we, I covered a lot of these, um, some of these I already talked about. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Let's go to questions. There were a couple of them in the chat. Okay, let me read the ones from the chat. Okay, this student says, I'm applying to Berkeley College in a few months. The auditions are held in Zoom meetings live. What recommendations do you have for this auditioning method? Well, I have a couple thoughts about that. Sorry, <laughs> my nose is so stuffed up. Um, my first thought is, Definitely test out your equipment before the audition. Um, get some of your friends to do a mock audition with you over Zoom to make sure that your audio sounds as good as possible um, to check out that everything is working well. Make sure that you have a high quality microphone that you can use with your computer for the audition. Don't just rely on the, the microphone built into your laptop. It will not be as good as an external mic. So make sure you get a really good external mic to use with your laptop. And if you need to use that external mic with an interface, make sure you test out the interface. You know how to use it. Um, make sure you explore all of the settings on Zoom, particular for musicians, like making sure that original sound is on for musicians. Go into the, um, the advanced settings. And there are a lot of tutorials on YouTube and uh, all over the, the internet about this. But just look up the settings specifically for music because if you don't adjust the settings and you just go with the presets on Zoom, it will be a disaster. It will mute you when you start playing because the normal settings on Zoom are not designed for musical performance. So I'm not sure if you are already are aware of these musical settings or not. Maybe I'm telling you something you already know, but I would say prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, do at least a couple mock auditions with friends over Zoom and all the things I, I mentioned about audition clothing apply. Make sure you're wearing something super comfortable. The nice thing is that because you're playing over Zoom, um, you can wear really comfortable shoes. They're not even going to see your shoes. You could be in socks if you wanted to, right? You can wear whatever footwear you feel comfy in. Um, so if, especially if that makes you feel more confident or more comfortable, uh, you know, do what makes you comfortable. Make sure that you're in an area where you're not going to have ambient noise that could potentially disrupt your audition. Um, and the last thought I would have is that as a student who's not auditioning in person, it's really important that you reach out to the specific professor that you're interested in studying with and try to make a personal connection with them before your audition. If you haven't already, try to schedule a Zoom call with the professor so that they see your face, they can talk to you, they can get to know you a bit as a person. It's really important to make that, that 
that personal connection because that can make the difference between getting scholarship money or not. Um, if you're just a random face that they're briefly seeing in a recorded Zoom audition, that doesn't make as much of an impression as contacting them, setting up a short conference, or even asking to take a trial lesson with them over Zoom. Something like that so that you can make a connection and make an, a lasting impression on them. Okay, let's go to the next question. This person says, same here, I've been accepted and received a tuition scholarship to attend Berkeley next year. However, can you advise me about housing financial assistance? Right. That is tricky because Boston is notoriously expensive. It's one of the most expensive <laughs> cities in the United States. Um, really insanely expensive housing. I would say that your best bet is, I mean, you can try contacting Berkeley and talk to them. Ask them if they have anything like a housing stipend or, or special housing scholarships. But I think it would also be a good idea to get creative and kind of think outside the box. Maybe look for senior centers in Boston, in the Boston area near um, Berkeley and contact them. And if they don't already have an artist in residence program, maybe pitch it to them. Say, hey, I'm going to be studying at Berkeley nearby. I see that you have the senior residence. Would you be interested in um, sponsoring me as an artist in residence or something like that? And I can... Um, maybe I can leave the information for the artist in residence program that I did um, in by email or something like that. You can email me for information or I can leave it with the coordinators and then you can get it from them. But you could look on the website and read about the artist in residence program at, um, it's called Twin Towers in Cincinnati. Uh, and then maybe you could propose something similar modeled on that to one of these senior centers in Boston. Um, other than that, I would say start looking on like sites like Craigslist right away, trying to look for roommates or at least looking at housing costs, looking up apartments in Boston or looking on websites like Zillow. Um, I'll type that in the chat, Zillow.com or um, Craigslist.com. This will give you an idea of what the real rental prices are like in Boston. Um, prepare to be shocked. Boston is crazy expensive. A one bedroom can easily cost $2,000 a month plus. So it is really expensive. Housing will probably be your biggest hurdle to, to figure out, I would say. But that those would be my main ideas. Um, you can always appeal to the financial aid office. You know, like I said, if you have other acceptances from other colleges or universities, you can, if they're better offers or if they offer more scholarship or they have other perks like a, an extra stipend or something like that, you could try to leverage that and ask for more money. Or you could ask the financial aid office, is there any way that I could become a teaching assistant and earn extra money that way? Or sometimes there are student employment jobs, like you can become um, a librarian for one of the ensembles, like for the jazz big band, they probably employ a librarian who is in charge of uh, preparing all the parts, uh, you know, uh, organizing all the scores, et cetera, et cetera. That can pay. Um, look into all of the possible options that are available to you. But I would look at the real rental prices and that should definitely be a part of your consideration process of deciding, can I actually afford this? Is this realistic? Um, because rental prices are, they can be insane in, in all the major cities, Boston, New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, LA. Um, do we have any other questions? I have a question. Uh, I would like to know if in these programs you have applied, you encounter with an um, age limit for the applicants. I would say there's not typically an age limit. For example, when I, just to tell a quick story, when I started my master's degree, um, I was already 30, which is quite a bit older than a lot of typical master's degree students. But the reason that I was 30 when I started is because I had already applied to master's degree programs in the past. And I kind of made, I made a rule for myself that I would not apply, I would not attend a master's degree program without a full scholarship and a stipend because I don't come from a wealthy family um, and neither does my husband, you know, and we're both musicians. We weren't making a ton of money. We were both employed, but it's just very difficult to earn a lot of money as a musician. 
And so I didn't want to go into massive debt for a music degree. I didn't think that was fiscally responsible, to be frank. Um, it's, it's dangerous enough if you're taking out a big loan for medical school or law school, but at least you know that in those professions, you're almost guaranteed to make a high salary once you get your full-time job. Whereas in music, it's always an uncertain thing, right? You may or may not get into a big orchestra. You may or may not get that, that desirable professorship that you've got your eye on. So it's more of a gamble. So I just made a rule for myself. I'm not going to do my master's or my doctorate until I get a full scholarship and a stipend. That was kind of the promise I made to myself. And so I applied for master's degrees two other times before doing a master's degree. And it was very difficult to get offers, to get scholarships at top schools that I w would have loved to attend, but it wasn't what I had promised myself. It wasn't a full scholarship. It was maybe a 75% scholarship or 60% scholarship and no stipend. And I just knew that considering the cities they were in, the cost of living would have been more than I could afford. Even as a US citizen, I knew that it was unlikely that I was gonna be able to work enough hours per week on top of being a good student and being able to practice enough to make it worthwhile and attend all my classes. It was just gonna be very difficult. And I had already experienced that a bit when I was doing my undergrad because my parents weren't able to pay for my rent and my food and everything when I was in um, my undergrad. I had to work a lot of hours a week. And I made it work, but it was very grueling at times. And sometimes, honestly, my practicing suffered and my coursework suffered because I had to work so many hours a week um, as a nanny, as a hostess at a restaurant, playing lots of orchestra gigs, playing lots of weddings as a quartet violinist, stuff of that nature. So um, it was difficult. I remember there was one semester where I didn't get a very good grade in music theory because I was constantly doing my assignments like the last 15 minutes before class because I would have been up late last night uh, playing a gig at a wedding, like where the wedding after party lasted until 4 a.m. and I was playing with a DJ, let's say, or, you know, whatever, babysitting for the whole weekend and didn't have that much time to practice just because I needed to pay for my rent and my food, you know? So keep all of that in, in mind. But yeah, so I started my master's degree when I was already 30. I was very worried about whether that would affect me or if, if other students would treat me differently or, or anything. And I honestly didn't feel that it affected me all that much. People were really accepting and, and cool about it. And I actually felt that in some ways, I, it was really beneficial that I had waited a while to start my master's because I had all this extra experience, you know? I got to be a teaching assistant at my college, which is a really great thing to put on your resume. And it was partly because I had all these years of teaching experience, of professional teaching experience at, at music academies in New York City that I wouldn't have had if I had gone straight into a master's program. So it, it did work to my advantage somewhat. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, were there any other questions? I don't think so. Okay. Um, we... Okay, we... so um, you, you have her contact information. Uh, thank you, Holly, for all the amazing uh, tips and, uh, you know, the amazing presentation you gave us. I learned a lot. You know, I work, uh, you know, assisting students uh, to apply to uh, uh, universities in the U.S., but this for me was a master class in how to apply to, you know, uh, music uh, programs. So thank you very much, Holly. Uh, for this amazing presentation. Thank you, everybody, to, for being here. And, uh, well, hopefully we'll be seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope it was helpful. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.